Mm -hmm. So hi, everybody. Most of you know me, but my name is Carol Stern, and I'm a librarian here at the Glen Cove Public Library. Uh, before we begin, I just want to make a few announcements. One announcement. Um, the next book we're reading is Remarkably Bright Creatures. Mm -hmm. That's on a Monday, not a Tuesday. So it's Monday, October 23rd at 2 o'clock. So uh, please sign it up. I'll send out a notification tomorrow. So welcome Heather Marshall, uh, who has written a debut novel, Looking for Jane. I don't think this book could be more timely. It should be required, in my opinion, and should re uh, be required for all reading. Heather was born and raised in Canada, where she lives with her family and their giant golden retriever and baby. After completing two masters, Heather worked for several years in politics and communications before finally turning her attention to, to her true passion, which is storytelling. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them after the discussion and you can unmute yourself after the discussion and maybe Heather could answer a few of your questions yourself. Um, again, we mark your calendar for Monday, October 23rd. So welcome Heather, thanks for uh, being here today with us. Thank you for having me. What inspired you to write this story? There's been some big to big topics to tackle in the novel, uh, let alone a debut novel. You know, could you talk about how you came up with this? Why do you think it's an important story to tell? Yeah, the um, the idea for the story sort of came together over the course of many years. <laughs> um, back when I was doing my history master's degree, I was doing a major paper on Henry Morgenthaler's provincial court battles in the years leading up to our Supreme Court decision in 1988 that decriminalized abortion. And at the time, I thought this would make a great novel. Like it's it's just so dramatic and compelling. Um, and I was sort of surprised that no one had done that yet. But at that point, I wasn't sort of seriously considering writing as a career. And I was actually chipping away at some other novel that never saw the light of day. And then years later, I just stumbled across an article uh, about the maternity home system from 2014 or something. And I was just struck by the number when I saw that over 300,000 women, girls, I'd had their babies taken from them by threat or force or coercion under this system that was just so shocking to me like that's the size of a small city that number and so that at that point i was actually looking for a new idea for a novel and so i started doing yeah, some probably. research on that and i had this other idea for a novel about the history of abortion access in canada and i sort of couldn't get either of them to to move forward in the way i wanted them to and then one day it just occurred to me that they were actually these two threads of the same story, which is women's fight for agency over their lives and over their bodies. And once that kind of clicked, um, the story sort of poured out of me from there. So yeah, the inspiration came from a few places. That's usually how it kind of works for me with stories. Um, and it just, yeah, fit, fit together um, in, a, in a really uh, satisfying way, I think. So you wrote the book as a fictional version of this. Why did you choose not to do a nonfiction book versus a fiction book? I think because I had always wanted to be a writer, um, but never kind of considered it as any sort of realistic career path. Um, I always kind of discounted it. I was sort of standing in my own way in a lot of ways. And at that point, I think I'd just been in school so long that I was so sick of writing nonfiction and essays and papers. I thought this is something that I want to do as a book. And things like this, you know, especially people that that read historical fiction, you're often reading historical fiction because you'd like to be educated about something. And fiction allows us to get that education in a really accessible, entertaining way that that we can relate to um, on a much deeper level, I think, than when you read nonfiction. So I thought for this story that I was trying to tell, I thought fiction was was the right way to go about that to get it to as many eyes as possible. Historical fiction is definitely my favorite genre. Like, I just love it. So can you talk about your research? Um, do you write with an outline? Was, how, how do you? I love this question because I'm, in the rest of my life, I am like a complete A-type personality. I am an over planner. I organize everything. I plan everything. I'm planning my life years, months in advance, except in my writing. Um, I just wing it and i have kind of a general idea of where i'm headed and who the characters are and what i want them to do 
Um, I've tried to be a planner when it comes yeah. to my writing. People have very I, I, fancy uh, spreadsheets yeah. and things, and I've yeah. Yeah. and I've tried that, and it it doesn't work for me. <laughs> so I just let the creative process kind of take over and and go from there. So was this a hard subject to write about for you? Was it, you know? Yes, yes. Um, in a lot of ways, I knew I wanted to write this story, but I think there was probably some naivete as a debut author that I sort of didn't realize how ambitious this story was in a oh lot my. of ways until I was sort of too deep into it to turn back. Um, mm. You know, the the three different storylines over different decades and the, the content that I was tackling. Um, yeah, I didn't fully appreciate what I was doing until it was, it was, as I say, too late to turn back. Um, but I'm glad I did. What was the hardest scene to write in the book? Like, what was the most difficult one? I think in some ways, um, the early scene with Nancy taking Clara for an abortion, um, because of things that I'd read, um, you know, women documenting their experiences. But in a, in a lot of ways, actually, was the goodbye room scene. Um, and I ended up editing that one when I was two weeks postpartum. So that was hitting very, very differently, um, especially when I was going through that whole, you're on that cocktail of hormones, you know, right after giving birth and you're so sensitive to everything, even on a good day. So um, editing that scene, as I say, just uh, definitely hit, hit differently. And I was able to have a much deeper appreciation for what these girls had gone through um, the research was really, really difficult. There were times where I had to kind of step back from it for a bit, um, especially when it came to the maternity home content, actually, um, it was really, really emotional. And I've said to my husband and other people since I'm actually really glad that I wrote it before I became a mom, because I don't know that I would have been able to handle the research now might've just been one degree too close to it to be able to tackle it, um, in the way I did. Cause you're just, you're so raw. Once you become a parent, it's, um, everything's different. So I'm, I'm glad that the timing lined up the way it did in my life and for the story. Can you talk about the maternity homes a little? I mean, it's absolutely awful what they did to these women, girls, women, just awful. And it's, um, it's the, the compounding horror is how little people know about this. Um, because the whole system was so secretive and so punitive that these girls were sent to these maternity homes by people that they trusted, their, their parents, their families, their priest. Um, and they were told, this is what's best for you and for everyone. And then they left and were told, okay, come home and pretend it never happened, never talk about it again. And with our sort of present day lens on that and what we know of, like the word trauma had hardly even been coined then. Um, so these girls never got therapy. Um, you know, there was, there was never any support for them. Some of them went to their grave, never telling family members about it. So thinking about that is just, it's just so awful. And as I say, you know, the, the supports that people have nowadays, um, you know, if they want to go through with a pregnancy and want to raise a child with, you know, really limited circumstances, there's a lot more support in place now for that. Um, so it's, uh, it's horrifying what they went through and that, you know, it's, it's just psychologically and emotionally torturous. And I think we, I won't get ahead of us, you know, uh, too much here. Cause I think this is a question you're going to ask later, but it was, you know, 300,000 women in Canada. Um, and that number is going to be exponentially higher in the States. Um, it, it would just be staggering because your population is exponentially bigger. So the number of women that were forced through this and then told to never talk about it again, um, one of the things that inspired me to write the book, kind of getting back to that point was, yeah, this, this number of so many women who had been, you know, impacted by this, but also that I was a feminist and a student of history. And as a feminist student of history, I had never come across this in any of my history books. I did not know that it had happened. So I thought, what are the odds that sort of, I'll say the more average Canadian um, who was not a feminist and not a student of history would have ever come across this in their lives to know that this had happened unless it was in their family history. And that was part of what I thought, you know, I, I need to shine a light on this because um, there currently isn't one. It's just entirely in the shadows. So, so going back to uh, in 
in the author's note, you wrote that a Senate committee studied the post-war maternity homes. Do you know what was found? And were these girls ever compensated in any way? They are not yet. Um, I've been working very closely with the organization that works with those women, trying to get, at the very least, an apology from the government. Um, they've apologized to countless groups that have faced horrific treatment at the government's hands over the decades. Um, and they still continue to push back on apologizing to these women. I think they fear massive class action lawsuit, um, but too bad <laughs> in my mind. Um, there have been no compensation. And in addition to the apology, one of the things that this group is really trying to fight for is some funding, not even that much, um, for trauma counseling for some women who have never had that um, and might not have the means to have accessed that at any point in their lives. Um, so yeah, no compensation, no apology, hardly any recognition at all. Um, the Australian government apologized in, I think, 2013 for a very similar scheme that they had. The States, Ireland, the UK, Scotland. Scotland has now apologized, as has Ireland. Um, and there were reparations for the Australian women, um, like financial as well, to the extent that, you know, that might help at all in terms of delivering justice. But it's at least some acknowledgement of of the government's role, but to date, no, those Canadian women have received nothing, and American sisters, as far as I know, nothing. Nothing terrible. It's it's unbelievable. How did you find all your information about all these the homes? Like, how did you do that? It was a really, it was a bit tricky. <laughs> um, again, because so many of these women never talked about it, it was hard to find them. So I contacted this organization, as I say, that I've been working with that helps um, you know, these women reunite with their children and provide other supports. And at that point, um, you know, I hadn't written the book yet. No one knew my name and my email kind of got lost. I never heard back. Um, so I had to look to other sources and I found some Canadian and some in the U.S. remarkably almost identical circumstances and experiences. Um, and they were firsthand accounts. So some researchers had been able to find these women and they'd given firsthand accounts of their experiences. So all kinds of things were, were pulled from that. Um, it, you know, in, in many ways, I didn't have to make up a whole lot. And that was a very deliberate decision too. Um, you know, and there were things that I didn't even include, uh, like, so many women described having a bag or a sheet or something to put over their head um, when they were giving birth, they wouldn't see their child emerge. Um, there was a lot of violence that occurred at the hospitals um, as well as in the maternity homes. And um, yeah, I, I included some of the horrible things that I had read, uh, not all of it. And I, I would encourage people if you can handle it um, to go do some research yourself and, and read these women's accounts. One of the things I didn't expect, because um, obviously I had no idea that the book was going to have the reception it did, um, but was hearing from maternity home survivors in the aftermath of the book's release. And in my author's note, I talk about how, you know, I, I felt a very deep responsibility to make sure that I got this right if I was going to do it. And I've heard from a lot of survivors who have said, you know, my experience wasn't exactly like that, but this part of it was, or my experience is exactly what you're describing, or my sister's was, um, and they share incredible detail with me about their experience. And then they'll say, you know, I've only ever told two other people about this, but I feel a need to tell you. Um, and that's a, a very humbling, um, but emotionally taxing thing for me uh, to hear from these women, but it's... Um, very gratifying to know that I, I did uh, get it right because I, I I felt I needed to honor them in that way. Did you actually uh, speak to them in any, uh, you know, on the phone or did you meet with any of them? Or? Um, so beforehand, when I was writing the story, no, um, I had to go from all secondary source material, um, but I've spoken with many um, since. You know, it's funny, I never heard of the Jane Network either until I read this book. It, it, it was mind boggling, you know. Yeah. yeah. Was there anything you discovered while researching this book that you found to be particularly shocking besides the story you told or surprising? And what piece of information helped shape your story? Yeah, I think nothing that I haven't already mentioned, like the because I had done research papers on um, abortion access and what women had to go through to 
access any abortion, let alone a safe abortion. Um, those pieces were not as shocking to me because I'd already kind of done that uh, academic research before in another capacity. Um, but the the most shocking part was, yeah, all the details about the maternity homes. And I just thought, how how have I not heard of this? Um, and how have so many women gone through it? And women, women go through hell and don't complain and never talk about it. And there's so much stigma surrounding so many things that are a natural or common part of women's lives. And it's just, um, it's inspiring and heartbreaking at the same time. I think that women go through so much, um, that, that people don't know about that they, that they don't talk about. And with this book, I was kind of trying to, to do exactly that was sort of talk about the things that have historically sort of only been whispered about among women. And I wanted to kind of pull that to the surface a little bit. It's funny, you talk about a subject that's very passionate at this time. I guess that was the message you wanted to bring out in 2009 when you wrote the book, uh, you know, look what's going on, to, you, you know, you saw into the future, but not really. I I sort of can't believe it. I, I got the idea for the book in late, late 2018 and then wrote it over the course of 2019. And yeah, I mean, with what's happened in the States, you know, this issue has always sort of been simmering and to some extent in some states more than others, as we know, um, there's huge divides there, but it hadn't sort of boiled over in the way it did last year. Um, so the, the timing I never could have predicted. And, you know, I like to sort of say this was supposed to be historical fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think the, the marketing team at Atria kind of had one, one idea in mind for sort of how they wanted to sort of package this and pitch it um, when they bought it in April. And then the Supreme Court decision got leaked, I think in late April or May, it was weeks later. And then the decision came down in June. And I think they were kind of reassessing, okay, what, what is this book now? Um, and what does it mean in light of, in light of what's happening? So I'm, I'm very grateful that it got to US readers. We didn't have a US publisher until after it came out in Canada um, for various reasons. There was some hesitancy about that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful that it's that it's gotten to US readers at this time, because I think we need these stories now more than ever. So I hope there will be more um, coming that, that kind of touch on these topics. So when it comes to pro-life versus pro-choice, do you think reading your book and all this what's going on today will bring women closer together you know, on the same issue? Do you think that it'll get people to get more, yeah. not so divided? I, yeah, I'd love to see that. It's um, it's one of the most polarizing issues I can think of. Um, but my hope, and not even really my intention in writing it, I just kind of had this story that I felt I needed to tell, and these characters, you know, um, told the story for me in some ways. Um, but I think my hope in the aftermath is that it will at least kind of bring people to some place of compassion, where. You can be standing beside a person, maybe you would make choices that are drastically different from the choices they would make for their life. But, you know, there should just be some, as I say, a level of compassion and respect in allowing them to make those choices, even if they're different from the ones that you would make. And I hope that that's sort of where we can come to, because I think people are so entrenched on both sides of this issue. Um, they're, they're not going to move, most people. So I think I was trying to sort of show all the gray area in between and that this is not as black and white as you know people on both sides may make it out to be um and so i hope that that some readers take that away i've, I've heard from some readers who said you know i only read this because my book club picked it and i've been very pro-life but i now have a more nuanced understanding of why someone might do this and i'm going to go and think about that a little bit more um i've had one person say that i converted them to be pro -choice. So, um, um, but that yeah. wasn't even the goal, really. It's just, can can we get people just thinking a little bit more, um, you know, about their fellow humans? And can we just kind of live and let live? Uh, you know, I was trying to kind of show that that is possible um, if we can all have a little bit of respect for each other and for each other's decisions. You think there was a ripple effect in Canada from what happened in the U.S.? Was there a ripple effect? Yeah, I mean... Ideologically and politically, we're we're facing a huge swing back 
to the right um, in states, you know, all over the world. And that happens, right? We, we swing right and we swing left and we kind of come back to the center over time. Um, so, I mean, in terms of abortion rights access in Canada, fortunately, our system is set up differently. So it's much harder to dismantle that in something like a Supreme Court ruling being overturned. Um, our healthcare is administered at the provincial level. There are certain sort of safeguards in place to, to protect that. Um, but I do like to say to people, you know, I, I always caution vigilance because, you know, Canadians do like to kind of hold this sort of sense of moral superiority, um, but rights get stripped in inches, not miles. And so you need to be vigilant to watch for those inches and push back when you see it happening. So. Um, I'm personally keeping a very, very close eye on a far right conservative party that looks like it may be elected in the next election. Um, you know, you're never treated better than when you're being wooed. So right now they're saying they won't touch the abortion issue, um, but who knows once they're actually in power. So I think we always have to be not paranoid, but certainly on the lookout because a country like America can, can have this happen literally overnight. Um, I never, I never, things on its head. I never thought it would happen here in my, in my years. It's, it's amazing. So, did you know from the beginning the way Evelyn, Nancy, and Angela's stories went into um wine with each other, or did the uh, character? You said that you you go as you write, but did you did you have any inclination that it would start from the beginning? Yeah, I had some sense of how they were going to intertwine. Um, and I knew the ending um, and that sort of all three of them would kind of be there at the end and that Angela would be sort of this link between the two trying to connect them over time. Um, so, yeah, I had, a, I had a general sense of where it was going, but the characters do. I, I forget what author I had heard talk about this back when I was not published and, you know, learning the craft of writing and some author had said, oh, I had a plan for my characters, but then the characters took over and they started taking it a different way. And I thought, but it's just artsy fartsy nonsense. You're the one writing the book. What do you mean the characters just took over? And then it happened to me and I went, oh, okay. So you have a plan. And then all of a sudden sort of the characters' voices in your head are like, I think we should do this. I think this is what I would do. Can we try that? Um, so it sort of meanders a little bit, um, but they they found their way back to each other, those, those three characters in the end. Yeah. Are any of the characters like you? Can you identify with any of them particularly? I ask this a lot and I don't really have a good answer because I think I was in many ways you know debut authors there's usually some piece of themselves in the book um you just kind of have to get it out there but for this one I don't know that there really was because in many ways I felt more like a scribe like more like I was channeling these other women's stories than kind of creating my own in a sense um but I think to some extent maybe Angela I've talk to a few book clubs and this sometimes becomes a very heated conversation about if you were to find a letter like Angela did, would you open it? What would you do? And I think there's a part of me that I guess must just be very nosy, but I would go, well, it's been here for almost a decade, clearly wasn't going to be found. I guess we'll open it and see if we can get it to the right person. But oops, I've opened this bombshell. Um, but some people are very, I would never open someone else's mail, no matter what. Um, no one has expressed disbelief in the character doing it so they clearly must know people that where that would be entirely plausible um but it's a funny sort of question and i totally think that was that was definitely a little piece of me in there going well we clearly have to find the answer here it's a little bit of a mystery let's let's <laughs> unravel it i probably would have opened it too <laughs> <laughs> So in the author's note, you wrote, when people ask me, so, uh, ask me, so what is the book about? Your first inclination is to say the book is about abortion, but it isn't. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, I think when I first started writing it, I thought I'm writing a book about abortion, about the history of abortion access in Canada, and I'm kind of tying in these other elements. And then as the story unfolded, and particularly, actually, Angela's character in my first draft was much younger, um, was straight. She was not trying to get pregnant. Very different character. And I realized, you know what, I actually kind of want to show a bit more of a 360 on this issue. Um, you know, I wanted to show women who are desperately trying to not be pregnant and women who are desperately trying to become pregnant and show what what that does to you kind of on both sides of this spectrum 
And then with Nancy kind of in the middle where she, you know, at some points in her life goes, yep, I cannot do this right now. And then at a later point, just a few years later, things are so much different and she's in a better place and able to take that on and wants to take that on. Um, because so many women I talk to, you know, you kind of are at those three phases in different points in your life and it can change from year to year. Um, and I really kind of wanted to show again, the, the nuance of that and that all of this is related to motherhood, um, in some way, shape or form. It's all about motherhood and deciding when and how you want to become a mother. So why did you decide to write about the, sti the stigma of motherhood? Like what made you wanted to do that? You know what? I honestly didn't, it wasn't a conscious decision. I think it just kind of came up and came into the story sort of organically when I knew that I wanted to write about these issues. They were just kind of inherently about motherhood. And then that was sort of naturally where the characters took me to, to explore those stigmas. Yeah. So you were pregnant when you started working on looking for Jane and then you had a baby. I was pregnant when I was editing it. So I was actually didn't even have family on the mind really when I was writing it, um, which again, given the research I had to do and everything, I think was a good thing. Um, just being a little bit more removed from it. But then during the editing process, yeah, I was pregnant and then had a very new baby as we were just finishing up the copy edits. Um, so it, I was able to kind of add in little pieces of myself, little things about pregnancy or, you know, that, that were then more familiar to me, um, as I went along. But, um, yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm really glad that it kind of lined up in my life the way it did. Have you had, have any of these women, um, met, you know, now that with, with 23 and me and all this genetic testing, do, do you know if any of these women have found their children or? You know, when they, you know absolutely absolutely there have been a lot of people um getting surprised by what they find when someone in their family enters their genetic material into 23andme um women being found who never expected to be and maybe never wanted to be um people being kind of outed in their family um or you know tragically people finding this out you know after the woman has already passed and the children discover this and would have wanted to reconnect um, but, oh my gosh, those, um, those genetic websites are, <laughs> they're a can of worms for a lot of families, but, um, also kind of a blessing for many people too, that are, that are on this, this hunt, um, this kind of existential journey of trying to, to find their origins. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something. I mean, I know, I, I know people that, you know, this one's related to that one. They have seven siblings that they never knew about. Right. Yeah. A lot of people finding out that someone that they thought was their, you know, um, aunt is actually their parent, like that kind of thing too. Um, where 16 year old girls had a baby, parents then raised the baby as a much younger sibling and that kind of thing. There's a lot of that. Yeah. People being kind of camouflaged, uh, within the family. So you want to talk about the title a little, uh, was this the original title? What is the significance of looking for Jane? Yeah, so I've discovered um, now that I'm kind of more into the publishing world um, that m most authors have kind of a working title for their book. And a lot of the time that doesn't end up actually being the title. Um, you think it's the best one and then your agent and editors and marketing teams and everybody kind of gets their hooks in it. And there's all kinds of factors that go into choosing a book's title. Um, but this was the original. And that was when I had that first idea for the reunion scene. I thought the the last line is going to be I've been looking for you and the book is called looking for Jane and that was you know because each of the characters in some way or another is looking for Jane um who Jane is kind of varies um so I was I was very pleased with that and I always love a book where the title kind of has multiple meanings or even after you've finished the book the title has a deeper meaning than it did before you started I always sort of love that um, so I was very glad I never got any pushback. There was never even a suggestion that the book be, be titled anything else. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to, got to keep that. So let me ask you something. When, um, I was, I was going to say, um, so these women that they, um, that they come and they found out who they're, you know, that they took the babies away from them. Um, have you met any of those women and have you met the James in the book? 
I have met a couple of the women that went to the maternity homes. Yep. Um, and I'm working closely with a couple of them who are advocating very heavily for the apology from our government. Okay. Um, and it's quite, it's quite an honor to do that. And, uh, yeah, I have met a couple of the, the Janes. They didn't have that, that name in Canada. It wasn't quite as sort of formalized in a way, but, um, I interviewed a couple of them to get their sense of sort of what, what was this like kind of boots on the ground in that era? What did it, what did it feel like? What were you trying to accomplish? Um, what did the network look like? Um, cause it was very, very loose and was in sort of different cities. They kind of knew of each other's existence and it was just very much a whisper network. Um, but that was fascinating to, to hear about because they never wrote any of this down. What they were doing was, you know, completely illegal. Um, so it was great to kind of hear those, those oral histories. And they took a big risk at the time, you know, they really. Unbelievable. Like I, I, when you sort of step back and I, I hope this came through in the book, but I wanted to sort of demonstrate that these, these were everyday superheroes. These were women who had jobs and families and they they put everything on the line risking prison time because they believed that other women should have the ability to have control over their own bodies that they believed that was such a fundamental right that they were willing to risk everything um and i find that just so inspirational and overwhelming um it's very hopeful i think but um and again they didn't they didn't applaud themselves. They, they've generally not really been celebrated, right? They did it because they believed in it and they kept quiet. And once it was legal, they moved on with their lives and went, wasn't that great what we did? Um, so I did, I, I kind of wanted to celebrate them. I wanted to to give them a voice here and, and demonstrate the lengths they went to um, and yeah, what they risked. Many of these women were hiding it from their husbands, had no idea. Some partners were supportive of what they were doing. Um, you know, the doctors were obviously risking. Henry Morgenthaler had multiple attempts on his life. Um, his clinic was bombed, all kinds of things. Um, and they, they continued to, to take those risks because of what they believed in. Can you talk about that, uh, Dr. Henry, that um, and Evelyn, the relationship? Can you go into that a little? Yeah, that was fictional in my mind. Um, they, I mean, Evelyn's a, a made up character, but I got a lot of information about Henry Morgenthaler from these women who worked with him um, during during those years when they were fighting for abortion access. And he was just um, a pretty incredible human. He was the Holocaust survivor, um, a true sort of humanist, and just, again, believed so fundamentally that women should have the right to abort if that's what's best for them in their life. Um, and again, the stakes were just so incredibly high and he continued to go to prison and yeah, have his life threatened and attempted on, um, just, just incredible. And, and yeah, I, again, wanted to kind of celebrate him. And so that's why he sort of makes that, that little cameo there. It was important to me to, to sort of see him and represent him a little bit in the book. I imagine he, is he still alive? He's not alive today. No, he passed maybe about a decade ago, maybe uh -huh. a little bit less. Yeah. But lived well into his eighties or nineties, I think, but, yeah. um, incredible, incredible life. So do you want to talk, I know we talked about it a little about the abortion caravan caravan in mm. Ottawa. Can we talk about that a little. Yeah. The scene, I actually had to kind of fight to keep this one in. Um, cause as you can tell, I'm a little bit wordy. So my word counts are always like, <laughs> 30,000 words over what we need them to be. You got to trim it down. Um, so there was some argument to, to slice that chapter. And I said, no, I got to keep it. Um, this was a lot of the, the material that I got from talking to these, these Janes um, in their firsthand accounts about going to the abortion caravan. It was a huge thing. And at that point, like women's lib was sort of hot news. So they actually got a lot of media coverage. Um, with what they were doing and you know it's it's kind of this action-packed scene they really did do all of these things again I didn't have to make up a whole lot um, they got the auto workers union to bring chains they chained themselves to the gallery um, they screamed and shouted and fought um, they couldn't all be arrested they went in with their male beards as they called them um, you know these these allies these men that that wanted to to help um, and all of that was very real. And as I say, it was one of those things that was kind of this piece of Canadian history that not a lot of people knew about. And I thought I, I'd really want to include that. Um, and so much of it was very real. They delivered the coffin to the prime minister's doorstep um, as this kind of representation. They had actually used the coffin. It was on top of their bus and it held all their backpacks while they were driving 
across the country. Um, so it was multi-purpose, but um, they yeah, delivered this symbolic coffin and said, we, we need something better. And all of that was in response to, you know, the, in 69, there was this vague loosening of the abortion law under incredibly strict circumstances. And you had to go to a hospital and have this team of men decide whether you were worthy of having an abortion. And that only came because the recorded death toll of back alley abortions got so high that the government could no longer ignore it. And that's only the recorded death toll. So that will probably send some chills down your spine. Um, but that was another reason why I thought this, this snapshot here in history is something that I really want to make sure gets included in the book. Um, cause it's history is it's pretty pivotal that moment, what they accomplished there. But how widespread was this in Canada? I mean, how, like alley abortions yeah. and death or yeah. uh, everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I guess nobody just talked about it. That's exactly it. Yeah. I know. And it's going on again today, which is really not a good thing. So are you working on anything next? Like, are you? Yes, I'm just in the final stages of revisions um, for my next book, which is due to come out in Canada, I think next spring. So hopefully in the US, not too long after that. What is it about? It's actually a World War II novel, which I never thought I would write. Um, but I came across a story about this Canadian war heroine. Again, so little is known about her. Um, but she's the only Canadian civilian woman to have been sentenced to death and imprisoned by the Nazis during World War II um, for helping downed Allied airmen get to safety in the Netherlands, she and her husband. And she ended up going to prison, escaping the prison during a bombing raid, making her way back on foot to the Netherlands, where they then thought she was a German spy. It was just like you sort of couldn't make this up. Um, and so when I kind of stumbled across her story, I thought, I think I'd like to write about her. So her character heavily inspires one of my main characters. And um, it's also uh, inspired by another woman, a Jewish woman who actually hid in her own attic when the Nazis confiscated her house and moved in downstairs. Um, she had a tenant in the attic who kept her hidden. And that's another incredible story that I've never seen fictionalized anywhere. So I've sort of woven those two together um into this story so it takes place in germany and it's actually about the scattered um but very present german resistance um during world war ii so um yeah that's that's what that's about but i never saw myself writing a world war ii story but again the characters sometimes just kind of grab you by the hand and say okay we're doing this now and uh, i'm doing lots of research um and i'm about third of the way done my my third book and uh, researching the fourth one so still lots lots in the pipeline that's interesting I, i'm just uh, for the next book we can talk about this but how do you come how do you come across these stories like where do you even find just falling down internet rabbit holes i i sometimes just start searching you know unsung women in history and then one article leads me to another to another to another um and i i don't know when you're a writer you're just sort of I feel like you always kind of have one ear open for interesting stories. And I do like to kind of pull mine from, you know, from real history. Um, some authors just sort of set their entire story in a historical setting, but I do like to kind of find these untold or undertold um, stories and kind of weave them together into my own. Um, Cause then I get to spend the author's note talking all about, you know, the real history and where you can go find more information and, and all that. So I guess that's just sort of, my style, but um, yeah, I'm looking looking forward to that one. So you were involved in politics and communications before you started writing. When did you actually? Yes. When did you start writing? You know, when did we, we as a kid did you write, or what made you change? As a kid, yeah, as a kid, um, kind of from the time I could hold a pen, and um, I don't know. In my late teens, I kind of had you know thoughts of doing a fine arts degree, or I thought about screenwriting at one point. I was very interested in screenwriting. And I think, I don't know, I'm a very sort of practical person. And I think the pragmatist in me just thought no one makes any money at their writing. Like you need to go to school, you know, do something that's going to get you a real job, <laughs> maybe try the writing at some point. Um, so as I say, I maybe was kind of standing in my way a little bit, but who knows if I'd actually given it a shot at that point. 
you know, I wouldn't have had this idea yet. Life kind of takes you, you know, meanders through its path and you sort of follow along. Um, but yeah, that was, I've been writing my whole, my whole life. And then in politics, I kind of, yeah, like I, you know, I wouldn't have come across this article on the maternity homes, I think, if not for my job in politics when I was looking for something else at the time. So as I say, life kind of takes you in interesting places, but, um, yeah, I've retired from politics. It's, uh, it's a little taxing on the soul. It, it has a bit of a expiry date on it, I think, or for me, it did anyway. And, uh, communications was, was lots of fun too, but, um, now it's yeah, full steam ahead on my writing. So you write full time now, nothing else. I do. Yes. Yeah. Besides being a mom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's full the full-time time job. But... Yeah, I'm full-time plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm basically finished with my questions. Um, if we want to open it up to the audience, I know they always like to ask a lot of questions. If anybody has any questions, if they want to say it or put it in the chat. I can pull some out of the chat maybe here. Okay. Oh my goodness, people have been chatty. Okay. I have not read House of Eve, but I've heard wonderful things. Yeah, it was another very good book also. Yeah, the Homes for Unwed Mothers in the States, um, very, very similar from what I understand. And there was one book, oh, what was the name of it now? It's a nonfiction and I'm sorry, I can't recall the title, but it had a lot of the, the firsthand accounts that I read. Um, you can i'm sure if you go search that you'll you'll be able to find it um but they were run by some different organizations again mostly religious orders or some denomination and yeah very remarkably similar similar experience um just just horrible uh there have been a few books and a movie about the janes in chicago did they influence you yeah i read um the nonfiction book written by one of the janes um, where, you know, the names have been changed and everything. And, um, I got sort of some information and kind of getting a sense of what, how they were organized, what it was about. And then that led me to try to do more research on Canada, which, which proved a little more difficult. Um, but at the time I was researching and writing this, there wasn't much, like there was that book, that nonfiction book and like a Wikipedia article and stuff. There wasn't a lot. Um, but then I know the HBO came out with the documentary back in June, I think, and, um, call Jane that film with, um, Sigourney Weaver was out. I forget if it was this fall or last fall. Um, so no, I had already written the book, but again, I'm, I'm thrilled to see more, more coverage of this. That's fantastic. Has there been a reaction to the book outside of the USA? So yeah, in addition to um, Canada and the US, it's been published in a number of, of different countries in different languages. Um, my agency is really, really good at their international rights. Um, but I think it's also, again, just kind of a book that that speaks to so many people, right? It, it kind of transcends culture and language. Um, so I think you know, people around the world have kind of been been feeling its resonance. Do you know if the parents knew the conditions they were putting their daughter into? Generally, no. Um, so they would have had a meeting, much like Evelyn's family, where the priest came to the house, said, okay, we have a problem, here's what we can solve. Um, they would have been pitched on, you know, the girls are going to get lessons every day, so that exactly that, so that they can go on to be good housewives, um, you know, they'll still be educated, they'll be kept busy, uh, it's sort of a dormitory experience, that kind of thing, that's, that's how it would have been pitched. But the, the primary driver was, um, no one will know. We, we shut the windows, we lock the doors, they are not allowed out, they are not allowed visitors, no one is going to know. So it will maintain uh, your family's dignity and she can come back home with her reputation mostly intact. So it's um it's difficult again right but trying to without letting the parents too much off the hook um times were were very very different how people viewed this was very very different so i think had had they known what their daughters were going to go through i would like to hope that most of these parents would have come up with another solution um but it's difficult to say just because of how different things were in that time
Yeah, it was so tragic to me that many of these women were told their babies had died um, and they were in truth sold. And yeah, that's um, there was a horrendous case in Canada in Eastern Ontario called the Butterbox Babies, um, which I, I won't even get into here. Um, but yeah, the selling of selling of children. And um, this was in the firsthand accounts that I read um, a lot of women were told by the people that worked at the home or by nurses or doctors, they said, the babies died, put it out of your mind. And I think that's why I kind of wanted to show Sister Agatha as a more nuanced character, because I do believe that she, with her kind of limited, you know, life experience and life view, I do believe that that was well-intentioned um, to try to help Evelyn move on. But again, what we, what we know now of traumatic experience and uh, how that would impact a person, yeah, not, not the right move. Oh, the Jane Network was on Cold Case. Interesting. Uh, I do not have a title for the new book I'm discussing. This was why I was able to say there's all kinds of stuff that goes into titles. I have, I've pitched a number of titles. Um, they have not sort of lit on one yet, so we're still working on that, but I hope to very soon be able to share a, a title and a cover for, for the next book. Thank you for the person sharing um, that you were you were one of these babies. Okay, thank you. I think that's it in the chat, unless anyone has anything to add here. Does anybody want to ask a question out loud? I think Lynn has her hand raised. Did you want to ask a question? I, I want to tell you that um, over 50 years ago, when I was teaching fifth and sixth grade, I had a sixth grader who became pregnant and wore big sweaters. So what did I know? Until I saw her around the corner from where I lived at the house for unwed mothers. Actually, she was walking down the street with some of her friends that she was living with. And I said, hi, Paula, how are you? And I, my principal got a call that I was never to ever talk to her. So I don't know what happened to her, but this has to be probably 55 years ago. That was very sad. De devastating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Never saw yeah, her some again. Of the girls, some of the girls were allowed out sort of on a day pass. Uh, a lot of them described having um, the home had like just very cheap, you know, um, dollar store type wedding rings that the girls could wear um, if they were going to go out to the corner store or that kind of thing um, to maintain this was the, called the, the secrecy Florence, of the pregnancy. Yeah, this Florence was called Nightingale. the Florence Crittenden, yeah, home for unwed. Oh, for Florence Crittenden. Crittenden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she was yeah, just, they, and, they were walking down the street to a store, these girls. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I had no idea that I wasn't supposed to speak to her. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I loved that. your book. I loved your book. Thank you. Loved it. Yeah, it's the first thing I thought of actually when I was reading your book. I bet. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, Heather, thank you so much. This was it's so interesting. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I thank you all for reading. I know there's a lot of books out there to choose from. So thank you for choosing Looking for Jane and giving it your time. Can't wait thank to you. That book. It seems just as interesting. Well, we've got a couple more hands, I think. Oh, go ahead. Um, I wanted to I wanted to say how um impressed I was, well, not only with the book and the author, uh, as a former librarian, uh a uh, high school librarian. I thought this was an extremely important book. I live in Florida, so you know what's happening with the book bannings here and all over the country. Uh, I'm devastated by all of that. Uh, Jody Picoult's books are I taken know. off the shelves, okay. and they are some of the most important books high school. Oh my God. People. But one of the reasons my question for you is, or what my comment is how brave those doctors were um, 
they were incredibly human and humane. And um, I thought bringing that out in the book was so important that they put their patient's health above, you know, even getting arrested. And uh, I really, I thought that was an important part of the book. It's just unbelievable courage. Yeah. Thank That's you. what we need nowadays. Unbelievable yes. courage. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. So I had a question. Do you see me? Oh, you yes, do. Marcia, Mar Mar Marcia, Marcia. Okay. Yeah. Marcia. So um, I picked up a little late, but this woman who was talking about Florence Crittenton School. So I worked at the Florence Crittenton School in uh, Love Denver. Love it's a home. But it's not a home anymore. Oh, I don't know wow. if you know that. Yeah. So I worked at Florence Crittenton in Denver, Colorado. And it became a um, partnership with the Denver Public Schools. Mm. So it's not a home anymore. The girls go to school. They get their diploma. Right. And I left a while ago, but I think now they're helping them find places to live. So it's not like that anymore. I thought I can do up to date on that. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, I yeah, know the maternity like homes that. still exist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's now the, the adoption rate is something it's, I want to say in Canada anyway, it's less than 1%. And again, the whole idea of being in the maternity home is to provide every support possible for them to succeed once they have the baby and, and leave to try to, to start a life. So yeah, very, very different model than it once was. Right. And mm. it's wonderful. I mean, it's part of the Denver Public Schools. And uh, the girls really flourish there. I worked there mm -hmm. for several years. So but I thought I'd bring that up so you'd know that it's evolved. Yeah, yeah. no, it has. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Boy, this was in Trenton, New Jersey, actually. Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I know they had come in New York too, but I was living in Denver. So, mm -hmm. so it's good to know it's evolved because I know it, the whole story of Florence Creek. Yeah. yeah. Susan, you have a question? Susan Jacobiak? I, I was just saying that if any of you have read the book uh, Before We Were Yours, which yeah. was essentially snatching children and selling them. Um, under horrible conditions, and that woman lived until she died in the 1950s. I mean, it was, but it was brutal. It was both because the stigma and the judge went along with her, and uh, it describes the, you know, the environment. They did not deal with abortion. They dealt with kids in homes and being essentially sold to famous people if they could, and that was also an egregious situation. <laughs> It's sort of like the House of Eve. Very similar. <laughs> I haven't read that. Oh. The, the doctor. Did you go with me and Joanne and Marty when we went to Boston? No. What was the name? Well, I think if anyone else has any other questions, Marsha, you have a question or is that? No, that was me. Yeah, that was me. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you again. And we really look forward to reading your next book and hope you come to discuss it again. Thank you all so much. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming, Heather. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful book.